Hi, I'm Linda Quinlan. Hi, I'm Keith Ghostland here with renowned <laughs> international <laughs> poet Linda Quinlan. Get out of town. I'm Ann Charles, <laughs> here with the same distinguished personage. <laughs> um, it is Tuesday, November 2nd. Uh, welcome to All Things LGBTQ. <clears throat> we have a lot of news, and we'll turn it over to uh, a wonderful internationally acclaimed poet. Our <laughs> favorite, favorite wicked woman. <laughs> oh my God. Ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> my headlines are the Trump administration to allow discrimination and adoption in health care. Katie Hill, the bisexual representative from California, resigns. ICE is definitely uh, detaining gay asylum seekers despite the court order that prohibited that behavior. Delta vows to restore deleted love scenes to Bookmart and Rocket Man after a week of backlash. That's nice. Ed Buck will spend over a year in jail uh, for, uh, because his trial won't be until August. Uh, as reported earlier, Ed Buck is a big Democratic political donor who had two gay black men die in his house from drug overdoses. Colorado designer wants to discriminate against same-sex couples, even though she doesn't really have a website yet. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. <laughs> All righty. In Georgia and Kentucky, lawmakers target trans youth. Uh, a two-gay police sergeant wins $20 million. Openly gay killer Charles Rise, Rines has been executed for a 1993 murder, but um, there's a little bit to talk about the politics of that. Yeah. Uh, a gay man was assaulted in alleged hate crime at a Boston bar. Radio host fired for allegedly sending homophobic tweets to himself. Top executive and LGBT representative sues Comcast, citing discrimination for being gay. <coughs> Andy King, a New York City Democratic Repu uh, representative, has been suspended without pay for 30 days and fined $15,000 for comparing pride to child pornography. And Sped Spelman College announces queer studies cheer in Audre Lorde's name. So we'll yes. talk a little bit about that. So, okay. You're just cheery tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, trivia. One person got it, one person didn't. I got it. Uh, <laughs> out in the mountains, <laughs> November 1987, front page article, and it was talking about the just march on Washington that had occurred. There was a reference made to a very moving speech that had been given by Karen Thompson. So who's Karen Thompson, and why was she included as a rally speaker? So then we're going to talk about some events. <coughs> One of the things is I want to remind people that this is open enrollment for the Affordable Care Act, which is still the law of the land. Mm -hmm. So if you need insurance coverage between now and December 15th is the time to enroll. And following up on that, please be talking to your health care providers in reference to Vermont Act 53. We'll talk a little bit about that in greater detail because your health information is about to go into a centralized pool to which all providers will have access. There is a symposium that's going to be happening on November 16th at Main Street Landing in Burlington sponsored by the Alliance of the Vermont Law School. Mm -hmm. How many alliances can we have? This is Stonewall at 50, a half century of LGBTQ plus civil rights <coughs> advocacy. It's nine to five. It's free because they had a grant from the Johnson Family Foundation, oh, but you good. do need to register online. And Beth Robinson, our favorite just Supreme Court justice, is the lunchtime speaker. Um, it's election day. And I'm going to talk about some of the races that are happening and why we may want to be paying attention to it. November is Native American Heritage Month. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a movie called Donlin mm -hmm. and how you can stream it for free for this month. 
and then we're going to talk about Toronto. We, uh, we could be the community newspaper for them. Yeah. And associated with that, I want to remind people that Wednesday, November 20th, is the Transgender Day of Remembrance and Resilience. And Ohavi Zed Synagogue in Burlington at 6 o'clock okay. is going to do the reading of names, mm. creating sacred space. And then there will be a potluck afterwards to which people are invited. Well, I have many <coughs> items of news that I hope you'll be interested in. The first involves gay penguins. Yes! I've mentioned them before on the show. I have an update. Christina, Claudia Lopez, the first woman to lead Colombia's capital. She was elected mayor of Bogota. She's an open lesbian involved with a senator. Um, very exciting news there. An anti-LGBT preacher is banned from Ireland over abusive views which are likely to stir up hatred. Bye -bye. And I'm glad to be able to report this story because he's also been banned from New Zealand. And when I was reporting on that last time, I identified him as Stephen Ambrose, who is a prominent historian. His name really is Stephen Anderson. And all the countries, 26 Ooh. countries in Europe have banned him. I don't know where Stephen Ambrose came from, but I stand corrected and I hope I haven't vilified Historian Ambrose, Ambrose <laughs> yes. Um, we'll, we'll take him to dinner if he ever shows. Yeah. My former school. Uh, all right, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> Qantas boss, this is news from the 1%. Um, in New Zealand, Qantas boss Alan Joyce marries his partner, Shane Lloyd, in glitzy Sydney Harbor wedding. Mm. So he's CEO, he's worth millions and millions of dollars. I have a picture of the couple on their way to their lavish ceremony. News from the 1%. All right. Uh, I have another picture of a entirely different uh, nature. A transgender woman was murdered in the El Salvador capital. Her name was Anahi Miranda Rivas. She was 27. Uh, I have a picture before you now. She was uh, beaten to death. On a more upscale note, the first Muslim Pride event to take place in London next spring. And it's going to celebrate the LGBT plus community after $10,000 was raised by a fundraiser. So there's been success there. That's going to be exciting. More news, uh, stories I may not get to, but I have pictures for. First, thousands join the Pride Parade in Taiwan. 200,000 people, there's a picture of them. Huh, that's celebrating. a lot of people. <laughs> My. The mayor of Manila, Isco Moreno, paints rainbow pedestrian lanes for LGBTQ people, but some people aren't happy. So the picture shows you uh, walkers on the rainbow crosswalks, but some of the LGBTQ community says, forget the aesthetics, let's have some rights. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, <coughs> one more interesting uh, visual for you. The openly gay New Zealand ambassador to South Korea attends a reception with his husband. And here they are before you. South Korean president um, greets New Zealand ambassador to uh, South Korea. His name, the ambassador's name is Philip Turner and his husband is Hiroshi Ikeda. Uh -huh. Maybe I'll have time to elaborate on that. But those are my Probably headlines. Not. Maybe not. <laughs> no. And she's at the other end of the table, so I know. watch out. <laughs> well, what I want to elaborate on is that the South Korean president's name is Moon Jae-in. So there he is with the two mm -hmm. All right. gay gentlemen. And now we'll move to the Trump administration. And... Um, they want uh, discrimination in adoption and health care. This, of course, was the same week as National Adoption Month. <clears throat> the administration is attacking LGBTQ families. 
The Department of Health and Human Services has a new rule that adoption agencies can discriminate against LGBTQ families even if they get money from the government. This is a reversal of the Obama era um, policy which did not allow uh, agencies who got money from the federal government to discriminate. Um, and this could also affect other, uh, other um, groups like Elder Services, Head Start, Refugee Resettlement, HIV Services, and Programs for Homeless Youth. So, Lock um, him up. Lock him up. <laughs> <laughs> Katie Hill. The bisexual representative from California resigned from Congress last week. She was being cyberbullied by pictures of a threesome as well as nude pictures of her on the internet by who she says is her abusive ex-husband. <clears throat> and there were pictures that were taken without her knowledge. Um, last, she said as her final act, she voted to move forward on the Trump impeachment on behalf of the women of the United States of America. She also talked about patriarchy and feminism. And if you want to see her whole speech, it is, of course, on the internet. Um, I thought it was a pretty good speech. And the only other thing I wanted to say about this was Nancy Pelosi talked about, you know, like um, somehow it made it seem like it was her fault that these pictures had gotten onto the internet. And, uh, you know, I just want to say if, if, she did not know about this, and it was cyberbullying, then it was really hardly her fault. I was disappointed so, in Nancy Pelosi's too. response also. Um, so I, I didn't think that was really a good um, way Emma, of approaching that. This is revenge porn. And yeah. Vermont, several sessions ago, passed a law that you can prosecute mm -hmm. someone for... You should be able to. Yeah. And Pelosi's remarks seemed almost like blaming the victim. Yeah, there. like it was her fault somehow mm -hmm. that this has happened. Um, you know, despite the fact that if she suffered the staff or it's probably, you know, it's not a good idea, but okay. Colorado designer wants to discriminate against same-sex couples, even though no LGBTQ people have even asked. <laughs> and in fact, she doesn't even have... <laughs> she, doesn't <have> a website? <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't even have a website, but she wants to have a website. But before Lori Smith of 303 Creative in Denver puts up a website, she wants to be able to know that she can put up as a Christian that she doesn't want to do anything for um, LGBTQ people because it's against her Christian beliefs. Um, her attorneys are from the Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, <laughs> so, but I mean, she there. doesn't even have a site up yet. Okay. In Georgia and Kentucky, lawmakers target trans youth. In Georgia, Representative Jim, Ginny Earhart is preparing a bill that would make it a felony for medical professionals uh, to assist in minor, uh, in the minor's <coughs> tra transition in any way. In Kentucky, Representative Savannah Maddox has begun drafting a bill to protect children under 18 from gender <coughs> reassignment surgery or getting any drug treatment to alter their natal gender. So, mm. uh, so there we go. I'm, I'm not <laughs> even going to go into that if you are diagnosed with gender dysphoria, that you want to start all of that before treatment you go before into adolescence, yeah. Yeah, no, that's why they want to stop that, to make sure it doesn't happen, so. Okay. So there are elections in Kentucky, and it's the gubernatorial race, and apparently it's really close, mm -hmm. and people are watching this because next year, oh, the pro tem of the Senate Ew. might be up for re-election from Kentucky, and this may give an indication of how vulnerable he is. The other races that are happening are in Virginia, and Vice President Pence has gone and campaigned on behalf of the Republicans. This is Donica Rome's 
first re-election bid. So we're going to be watching really closely what happens in Virginia. Also, there's a real chance that the Democrats can take control of both houses in the Virginia legislature, so they might actually pass some non-discrimination legislation. Well, and Donica Rome is the first trans. She is the first transgender legislator anywhere in the country. Right. So, and, and that happened two years ago. So Tucson, Arizona, we're going to be watching because they have a referendum going to see if they're going to become a sanctuary city. Hmm. This in the era of 45's repressive immigration. South Bend, Indiana, where Mayor Pete may be coming from, he's not running for re-election. We're going to be watching to see who gets it, who comes in following him. And there's a citizens initiative in Washington where they got enough signatures to try to overturn Initiative 1000, which would have allowed for affirmative action policies and public education employment and contracting. Mm. So they're trying to pull back proactive legislation. Very quickly, this is Native American Heritage Month. There is a film that's been released called Donlin that hopefully Zach is going to be able to put up the website where you can go on this month and stream it for free. Mm. And it's, it's PBS Okay. If, if you can't find another way in. And one of the things that's significant is that this documentary was done in Maine. So they're very close to us. Why they say we should be paying attention. For most of the 20th century, government agencies systematically forced Native American children from their homes and placed them with white families. That there was an estimate that Native children in Maine were 19 times more likely to be removed by child welfare workers than non-Native children. Many children experienced devastating emotional harm in homes that shamed, demeaned, and tried to erase their culture. We should be aware that these atrocities are not history. This is an, still an active process. One of the statistics that they cited were you know, Native children in Minnesota are still 14 times more likely to enter foster care than oh. non-native children. So if you have a chance, it's a 54 minute documentary. There was a longer version that's available on the story website. Mm -hmm. Please watch this. Sounds good. Let's turn to the animal kingdom, uh -huh. happily. Penguins. Penguins. Uh, no. No? Yes. Uh. <laughs> Penguins and other species. Oh. Um, the, the penguin couple from Sydney, Australia, upon whom I have reported extensively, that is to say Sven and ah. Magic, the two male Gen 2 penguins at the Sea Life Aquarium in Sydney, who adopted a uh, foster egg uh, that became named Svenjik, uh, now, Svenjik is growing up, and I have a picture of the family group. They have a little chick now? Well, you know, Svenjik is maybe an, yeah, maybe yeah. an adolescence or early, you know. Okay. So the three of them, but then they've a, a, the, there's a possibility that another chick will be born. Uh. So Svenjik will have a sibling. Um, when Svenjik was first born, last October, um, both dads did well. Keepers noticed that the power couple have started <laughs> to build a new nest this breeding season, complete with a special display of ice pebbles. <laughs> Penguin supervisor Tish Hannon told the 10 Daily they have the neatest and largest nest in the colony. <laughs> and when we noticed that another couple were struggling to incubate two eggs at the same time, we made the decision to foster the second egg to the power couple of the colony. In September last year, lesbian penguin parents hatched a penguin chick 
in the London Sea Life Aquarium. Keepers have decided to allow the chick to grow into an adult as genderless, which is normal in the wild until they mature. But I'd like to expand our recognition of this gay penguin couple to include uh, a clip that I'd like to show now from the Sydney Zoo. The term gay or bisexual is a sort of human term, but we do see a lot of same-sex pairings of different species, including penguins, um, where uh, animals of the same sex, uh, species of the same sex, will, will form pair bonds together, um, and they can spend up to their entire lives living together um, in harmony. So we have three same-sex pairings um, within our colony, and uh, these are male birds that are together and they live together. We do have one pair, Ronnie and Reggie, um, that actually have reared a chick of their own. They, they um, an abandoned egg was um, given to them, the chick was given to them, and they reared it, and the, the offspring is currently living with the colony on Penguin Beach now. While animals can have same-sex relationships or pair bonds, um, they don't become uh, homophobic because that's a human uh, uh, problem. And animals don't tend to react in the same way um, when animals form same-sex pair bonds. They are generally well accepted within the colony or within the community. When you talk about some of the mammal species, there's examples, particularly in primates closest to humans, the things like macaque monkeys, where they will engage in sexual activity um, with members of the same sex and probably the most famous well-known is the bonobo, which is a, a relative of the chimpanzee, which is very, very widely known and widely studied for having regular sex between um, both females and males um, and you know, doing that on a regular basis purely for pleasure rather than any other kind of um, understood scientific reason. Other mammals um, will also engage in same-sex uh, relationships, so um, some of the cats, particularly lions, are known to uh, mount and copulate each other during um, uh, periods of pair bonding, but also probably more well-documented are some of the domestic animals, including cattle and sheep. It's well-documented that a number of species of insects, particularly after they first hatch or metamorphosize, will, will mate with individuals of their own sex. And we see that in things like fruit flies and certain beetle species. Um, birds are very well known for pair bonding, and birds usually, many long-lived species such as albatross and swans, as well as penguins, will pair for life. And if there aren't um, enough individuals of the opposite sex, they will often choose a member of the same sex because that instinct, that, that need to bond with another individual is very, very strong. I love those clips. <laughs> it's great. Don't you feel like a grandparent now? <laughs> <laughs> and it says wisely that homophobia is a human. Absolutely. You know, animals don't have it. So yeah. they're all faring well in the zoos and in the wild, all these LGBT. You mean the other penguins aren't marching around saying, Yeah. <laughs> Kill the gays. <laughs> <laughs> no, they aren't. And, you know, the clip illustrates all that. So let's turn to another good story, if I may, about uh, <coughs> Claudia Lopez. She's the leader of Colombia's Green Alliance Party, um, and she has just won the mayoralty of Bogota, and I have a picture before you now of her celebrating. She kissed her partner amid a roaring crowd last weekend as she became the first woman to be elected mayor of Bogota a position considered second in importance only to the presidency in a country known for its culture of machismo. She is now the first openly gay woman to be elected to that office throughout Latin America. The 49-year-old won Sunday's election with 35.21 percentage of the votes. I'm aware that I've the re received the fruit of the labor and fights of many generations of many women, Lopez said in her victory speech. They led the way for us to get here. Lopez was raised by her mother in a working class neighborhoods of Colombia's sprawling capital with five younger siblings. She worked as a housekeeper while getting her master's in public administration and urban policy from Columbia University in New York, 
and later earned a PhD in oh, political wow. science from Northwestern University. Wow. Uh, she entered politics in 1989 during a mass student movement that followed the assassination of Colombian President Luis Carlos Galán. One of the most significant groups she was involved in became known as the Seventh Ballot Movement, mm. credited for successfully forming a constituent assembly in 1990 to reform Colombia's constitution. Her victory, and this is sort of interesting, her victory was a reminder of these origins as it was Galan's son who Lopez narrowly defeated in the race for mayor. Ah. <laughs> Uh, to the day in which a humble woman who is the daughter of a teacher and diverse wins for the first time the second most important elected office elected by the people in the country, Lopez said during her victory speech. Video captured by the CNN affiliate showed the moment Lopez won kissing her partner, Senator Angelica Lozano, and I wish I had a picture of that, but I couldn't get one. She kissed her Sunday night, sharing an emotional embrace with her mother. Both Lopez and Lozano are affiliated with the Center Green Left Alliance Party. Colombia is the only country in which the same political families from the 20th century are still governing in the 21st century, she told CNN. Colombia is a country that has advanced in many things, but it's still got a lot of machismo. It's a very conservative country, mm -hmm. so congratulations yes. to her. I have one more uh, story, unless you'd like me to wait with it. Um, I think you could probably do one short story if you have one. All right, well, let me return to this person whose name I mixed up last time. Um, <laughs> Minister for Justice, Charlie Flanagan, signed the first exclusion order against Steven Anderson in May. Um, <laughs> the mayor for justice, Charlie Flanagan, banned uh, Anderson from speaking in Ireland because his views were, are considered likely to stir up hatred. A copy of the exclusion order was sent to Mr. Anderson. Uh, it reveals the minister's decision um, Anderson founded a Baptist church in Arizona, came to prominence when he said he had prayed for the death of President Barack Obama. Oh. He also prayed the, praised the killings of the 49 people in the Pulse, Pulse. nightclub. Yeah. He was said to deliver a sermon in Dublin earlier this year with notice, he was set to deliver a sermon in Dublin with notice set on his website saying he was coming in May. Oh. Um, the mood the move, this announcement, led to an online petition calling for Anderson to be banned because of his anti-LGBT rhetoric, which attracted 14,000 signatures, as well as calls from Evangelical Alliance Ireland not to allow him into the country. So he's Good. even alienated the Evangelical Alliance. <laughs> Following his exclusion, Anderson said, Anderson said Ireland would feel the wrath of God because of the decision, <laughs> but he said he would not beg to be allowed into the country. He's been banned everywhere. Good. Yeah. So here we. Except in like some other countries, like not so far. Well, in Europe, twenty-six Europe, countries no, have banned him. No. Uh, New Zealand just banned him, as I reported last time. <laughs> so he's not making much progress. Good. And that's good. Well, who's the <coughs> who's the woman minister who is involved? Is is considered Trump's uh, <coughs> White, minister. is it? What is her name? White, I think. No. Anyway, I heard her today giving a little speech about, you know, if um, anybody voted against Trump, you know, they were um, voting against God. Yeah. Pamela uh, White? If I had my phone, I'd look it up. Anyway, let's get to... Um, some more stories. Two gay two a two gay police sergeant wins twenty million dollars in a discrimination lawsuit. A jury decided the St. Louis police denied a promotion to an officer because of his sexuality after he was told that the command staff has a problem with his sexuality, saying, Would you mind toning down your gayness? 
I'm sorry, I take that personally. <laughs> I, good. I, I, I mean, good for that he has won. Yeah, Sergeant absolutely. Keith Windhaber brought a suit against the county police after he was denied promotion to lieutenant after serving since 1994. He was passed over for promotion 23 times. So $20 million, nice. You can retire on that. Uh, yes, I would think so. <clears throat> and here's an interesting story about the openly gay killer, Charles Rines. And he was executed in, I think it is North Dakota, South Dakota, um, very recently. And, and one of the problems with this suit was it's, it, it was not that he didn't even do the crime, but the fact that the jurors in 1993 argued that um, they didn't want to send him to prison because he might have too much fun there. And um, so, you know, basically because of his sexuality, um, he was given the death penalty. Uh, he killed a uh, Donovan Schaefer, a 22-year-old worker at a Rapid City, South Dakota shopping shop during a robbery. So there was no, um, he did it. But the reasons he got the death penalty seemed really horrible. And they, they um, <clears throat> tried to, some lawyers tried to uh, appeal. argue his case and appeal, but it never went anywhere. So anyway. May I just say one thing? Yeah. Her name is Pamela White. She's a televangelist based in Florida and personal pastor to President right, Trump. Right, right. So that's the person. Yeah. And, and if anybody is interested in that, she gave a little talk today about uh, God punishing all of us for not voting for Trump. Nice. <clears throat> I know. A gay man was assaulted in alleged hate crime at a Boston bar. Three men identifying as queer said they were the victims of a homophobic assault outside Jacques Cabaret early Sunday night. They were physically assaulted by a group of straight men, according to one of the men, Michael Flowers, on his Facebook page. The attackers used anti-gay slurs while kicking and punching the three men. The Boston Police um, Department of Civil Rights is investigating this incident. And a radio host fired for allegedly sending homophobic tweets to himself. Did you hear about that? No, no. I missed that one. Seth Dunlap denies he did any such thing. The slur was sent after he criticized New Orleans Saints quarterback Drew Brees for appearing in a Focus on the Family video. So the Louisiana um, radio station fired him because they said he was using the station's Twitter account to send messages to himself. So I don't know about that. <laughs> but... <coughs> I'm telling you. And then there was another lawsuit. A uh, top executive in LGBT rep uh, sues Comcast, citing discrimination for being gay. Clayton Fennell began working for Comcast in 2001. And the lawsuit contends that discrimination stated sh started shortly after he started working at Comcast. And that Comcast made a very hostile work environment for him. Early in his corporate career, he was told he was too gay and too flamboyant for Comcast corporate culture. Mm. Some senior leaders said his voice was too high-pitched. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> and he was also asked three times to take a demotion and move to San Francisco where it would be more acceptable to be gay. Oh my gosh. So. And a really good story is Spelman College announces Queer Studies Chair in Audre Lorde's name. Spelman is a prestigious all-women black college in Atlanta, Georgia. The newly created chair will be attached to the school's comparative women's studies program. And Audre Lorde, as we know, mm -hmm. uh, was an African-American poet an essayist. Uh, and when did she die, Ann? Do you remember? No, um, but I can look that up, too. She died probably in the 90s, I would say. Yeah. Um, 
early 90s. And I always really loved her poetry. I loved her presence. I really, really liked um, who she was. And, um, and I love the uh, saying that she said, if the revolution costs what, more than 50 cents, Ann, or was yeah. it? $50. $50. It's not her revolution. I was at a conference where she was, and it was a women's studies conference, and these two scholars did a little song and dance saying, you can join for $50, you can join the National Women's Studies Association, and she came out afterwards immediately following this presentation and said, any revolution that costs $50 is not my revolution. It was yeah. wonderful. I know. She is a dynamic, wonderful person. Yes. And so anyway, that'll be something to look at and follow as time goes on to see uh, who who gets to be put in that position and, and whatnot. So we can now go back. We're going to Toronto. Toronto. But first, Thursday, the 14th, November, 6 o'clock, Pride Center in Burlington is the last of the local town hall forums where you can come and say, as the LGBTQ plus community, if you're advocating on my behalf, these are the issues that are important. Okay. So, Toronto, mm -hmm. their public library, the Palmerston branch, they gave space to Megan Murphy. Megan Murphy is the founder of the Feminist Currents website. She's also someone who says, you know, born woman, that's it. That sex is innate, male, female, or intersex. That she is not supportive of the transgender community. That while, you know, she doesn't argue that transgender women have a right to exist, she's worried about men disguising themselves as women and entering women-only space. Blah, blah, blah. One of the I'd issues... I'd like somebody to name one. One okay. of the issues is the library has a policy about promoting discrimination, contempt, or hatred to any group or promoting? person that they will not give space okay. to anyone promoting discrimination. I mean, so it's in their policy. Okay. That way, and I was going to get to that, okay. that if you are promoting these things, you can't use their space. Okay. So they received a petition with 9,000 signatures saying... 9,000. 9,000 oh signatures saying these people should not be able to use this space. And the presentation was sponsored by the Radical Feminists Unite, the event was sold out. Oh. But there were so many demonstrators out front that when she finished, she had to go out the back door. Mm. And this is the part that I just sort of go, the library's response was they'd already hosted a neo-Nazi group, so what's the problem? <sighs> the library. So, yeah, there you are. Dear to our hearts, Toronto. Yeah, there we are. Well, let me begin by clarifying that Audre Lorde died in 1992. Okay. Very, very young. I think she was in her 50s. Terrible loss for us all. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So I was going to look up her exact age when she died. I think she was in her, yeah, she was 50-something. Um, 58. Okay. But we digress. <laughs> um, let's go back to the Qantas wedding. Um, Alan Joyce and his long-term partner Shane Lloyd in uh, Sydney's famous harbor uh, tying the knot uh, in front of about 120 family, friends, and business executives. Joyce was a key campaigner for same-sex marriage, personally donating a million dollars to the campaign. And nuptials came new year, two, nearly two years after the yes vote. He and Lloyd had been together for 20 years, share a house in the inner city suburb, The Rocks, near the wedding location. The Qantas boss, who was the country's, country's highest paid 
CEO has raked in $24 million last year. And then there's a little, he wore a suit by Aussie-born <laughs> designer Martin Grant, whose outfits were favored by Meghan Markle during her tour <laughs> down under last year. So be informed about that. Our invitations must have gotten lost. In the <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. Um, let's talk, return to this terrible thing uh, in El Salvador. The transgender woman, mm -hmm. authorities say a group of armed suspects who were inside a van, gra grabbed Anahi Miranda Rivas, 27, and I have a picture again. You saw it in the beginning, but let's show it again. Um, in San Salvador, the capital, preliminary reports indicate <sighs> the suspects held and dragged her for several meters along the boulevard before they stabbed her with a sharp object. The suspect then left Rivas' body near a, light, a nightclub. Authorities arrived at the scene after a group of people realized what had happened and called 911. Additional details have not been released, but Rivas's death raises the number of hate crimes that have been committed against the LGBT community, especially against transgender women in the Central American country to more than 300. They have already seen been seven deaths this year and Anahi's death is the third most violent, a trans programs coordinator said. We urgently need the mechanisms that have already been put in place with El Salvador's National Civil Police and in the prosecutor's office to be applied. So. We have time. Good, let's talk about the uh, <laughs> first Muslim Pride event that's going to take place. Um, it's going to be held in London in the spring, as I said. Um, the celebration run by Charity Iman will take place in the capital. Um, Iman was set up in 1999 with the aim of helping LGBT Muslims who feel isolated due to prejudice toward them. The event will look to bring the people it supports together. So that's great. And wasn't there like, well, there was some I was reading, um, about Palestinian authorities arresting LGBTQ people in Palestine. Really, I didn't see that in my newsfeed. <coughs> yeah, I'll look for yeah. that. Um, do we have a trivia question or anything? Or? Yeah, we have a trivia question. Okay. But I, <coughs> I was going to go back to something that we were talking about while you were conferring with Zach. Uh, uh, apparently. We're to blame for the wildfires in California. Oh, I saw Did you that. See that. Yes. Tucker Carlson said that California has a diversity employment program, and they're hiring underqualified LGBTQ plus and immigrants, oh. and that's why they can't contain the fires. So I will give the trivia question, and then I'm told we might have a book review. Mm -hmm. So. Karen Thompson, March on Washington, 1987. It might be easier to identify who Karen Thompson is if I told you that her partner was Sharon Kowalski. And this was the lesbian visitation and guardianship hearing that started after <coughs> Sharon was in a car accident in 1983 and sustained severe head trauma and was in a nursing home, and there was a series of court battles, first allowing, then rescinding Karen's visitation, then granting it back, and finally the court ordered an independent evaluation to determine if Sharon had capacity to express her wishes. And when she was asked repeatedly, she always responded with, where do you want to live? And she said, St. Cloud with Karen. So finally, in December of 1991, remember this started in 1983, Karen was finally granted was like full years. guardianship. Yeah. And this was the first major visitation, guardianship, recognition of our rights as 
LGBTQ plus couples. And did you say where this was? What kind of state? Minnesota. Minnesota, okay. Because we were living in Wisconsin then, right? Mm hmm Okay, you're going to introduce your own book? Well, yes. <laughs> um, you're a self-contained act. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. We have many uh, features in this show, among them book reviews. Um, on March 19th, this my review of this memoir by uh, Esther Newton called My Butch Career. In 1985, Esther Newton's trailblazing essay, The Mythic Mannish Lesbian, Radcliffe Hall and the New Woman, appeared in the pages of the lesbian issue of Signs. Uh, Signs was a prestigious feminist journal at the time. I was a lesbian scholar. I remember reading that volume, reading the article. It was really uh, groundbreaking. Um, written in 1981 and published in this landmark volume, the piece, Newton explains, was my return to scholarly work, and it made masculine lesbians my subject. Finally, I could pull my career and my queer life together. But it is the period preceding this fusion that is the subject of this memoir. Newton follows a conventional chronological path, tracing her ancestral line and unorthodox childhood as she struggled to adjust as a half-Jewish illegitimate child whose birth prompted ostracism from her firebrand mother's genteel wasp family. Describing her early years with her mother and her mother's second husband and lifelong father figure, Saul, Newton clarifies, we signaled our deepest feelings toward and about each other, if at all, in a semaphore in which none of us were fluent. I love that line. Uh, Newton's life was also complicated by the fact in her early years that I became an anti-girl, a girl refused Nick, caught between genders. She loses her straight virginity at 17, and more important, is initiated into lesbian sex later that year. Introduced to the New York lesbian bar scene soon after, Newton provides a cultural snapshot, and here I'm quoting again. That's what being butch meant in 1959. A masculine girl like me who wore men's clothes, smoked Lucky Strikes, wore her collar up and t-shirt sleeves rolled, and dated femmes. This formative milieu demonstrates to the young Newton what it's like to be butch, the first identity that had ever made sense out of my body situation, the first rendition of gender that ever rang true, the first look I could ever pull together. Nevertheless, Newton doesn't come out as a lesbian until seven years later, during graduate school, where her dissertation would become the book Mother Camp, Female Impersonators in America, a volume that helped establish her, establish her reputation as a radical thinker in LGBT studies. When Newton leaves Chicago for New York in the summer of 1967, she under, undertakes her first sexually satisfying relationship with an older woman and discovers the political movement to match her beliefs in the form of second wave feminism. This chapter in the narrative rekindles the energy and tensions of that time, as Newton chronicles her involvement in the Upper West Side Witch, which stands for Women's International Conspiracy from Hell, the early meetings of the Gay Liberation Front, and interactions with such lesbian icons as Jill Johnston and Bertha Harris. Newton writes compellingly of her struggle to negotiate a long-standing friendship with a married heterosexual colleague during these years of political passion and contention. Six years after her arrival in New York, Newton acts on an impromptu invitation from friends to join them in Mexico, where she meets a French love interest who has re requested anonymity in the memoir. Having received tenure, yet alienated from academia, 
Newton embarks on a long distance relationship with this woman and eventually moves in with her in her Paris flat. This part of the memoir provides an, an informative counterpoint to the New York years as Newton explores the women's movement in France, dominated as it was by two separate factions, the feminist revolu revolutionaire led by writer Monique Vitti and Psyche A. Poe, led by psychiatrist Antoinette Fouque. According to Newton, the two groups were not on speaking terms. <laughs> another, key feature of Newton, I know, <laughs> another key feature of Newton's partial expatriation <coughs> is her quest to adopt the lifestyle of her butch role model, Gertrude Stein, yes. and to write an autobiographical novel, a project she eventually abandons before returning to the States. Barnard College's famous 1982 Scholar and the Feminist Nine Conference marks a turning point for Newton. Together with her friendship with feminist thinker Gail Rubin and perusal of an article by writer Amber Hollibaugh. These catalysts allow Newton to reject what she perceives to be the rigidity of certain lesbian feminist dicta and to finally declare it was okay to be butch for the first time in my life, I embraced it without ambivalence. I knew then that I would never be with another female partner who was attracted to me, but ashamed of who I was, who did not consciously identify as femme. Occasional debatable assertions notwithstanding, my butch career is an important narrative of liberation. They contribute singularly to the growing body of collective LGBTQ history. It covers the first 41 years of the writer's life, a time frame that calls out for a sequel. Newton concludes her memoir with a tribute to the queer writers who have preceded her. With this work, she has secured her place in that august pantheon. Very good. And it's a good book. May yeah. I add, there's a movie about her called Agility that's being filmed. And if you want to go on Facebook and look up Agility, you can see clips of her, clips of her reading. She's making the rounds kind of on a book tour. When's the film coming? I, uh, they're working on it. Okay. So, Commercial release or cable or... Can't okay. tell you. I was going to say, is this like an Amazon Prime and Netflix, or am I going to go to the Savoy and see this? Savoy, I would say. It's an okay. independent film. Okay. And it's in the works, and it looks very interesting. Okay. And what about Terminator with all that new feminist... Um, it's not getting good reviews. Oh, I can't wait till it comes out. We saw Harriet. It's fabulous. Harriet is fabulous. So, Okay, and with that... Are we done? I think so. We are. We're cooked. Okay. Remember to resist. resist.